so I'm gonna, you know, I have the great privilege of sitting with Francis and all of us sitting in the room, uh, just hear a little bit about him and just some of his perspective on the state of the industry today and what's really important to him and, you know, many like him as, as owners and, and the responsibility they have to, you know, evolve with, uh, not only technology, but really culture at large. And we're all changing as human beings, the way we, the way that we work, the way that we want to live, um, you know, the way that we, you know, employ transportation and a variety of other um, kind of cultural influences that play into technology adoption. And it's not just technology for the sake of technology, um, but truly, you know, the thoughtfulness and strategy that goes behind it. So I'm going to ask Francis to just introduce himself and give us some context on uh, traditionally how he has thought about his real estate strategy. And then we can jump into some of the questions. Sure. Um... Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you who may not know Time Equities, we own a highly diverse portfolio, about 32 million feet. Uh, we own property in 30 states and five countries, US, Canada, Germany, Holland, and Italy. Um, and we own all property types except uh, hotels. My strategy generally is, perhaps as a contrarian or added value uh, um, personality, um, I have a, a general theory about investment that if you sort of invest in generic uh, markets or generic products, um, that's okay if you have, a, have the cheapest capital in town then you can be an effective competitor with people of more expensive capital. But as a someone who's doing business tr with traditional equity and traditional banking, I have to distinguish myself by figuring out how to make uh, above, um, above market returns. So I always look for at markets where I can think differently than somebody else. Uh, where there may be a mispricing that's going on or whether there's the end of an economic cycle and I can come in and take advantage of uh, a very low pricing or disrupted, a disrupted assets. For example, we do a lot of, uh, we buy a lot of off under-occupied office buildings that we find uh, trade at a significant discount even when you include lease-up costs to what their values are once they're stabilized. Um, so, always trying to think a little differently than every, everybody else and uh, get pricing advantage by, by doing so. I think one of the things that really resonates with me about Francis um, and his strategy is that he's not complacent. A lot of us get comfortable in finding these successes in, in one particular type of product or in one particular type of investment, whether it's technology or a, a real estate asset, um, and this notion of continuing to push forward to learn what might out, you know what might be out there beyond the traditional scope or kind of the generic investment um, it's a really amazing thing to see and I think there's something for all of us to to learn from that um, and now I want to just jump into you know what are some of the most significant changes that you've seen as a result of new technology or emerging trends in the space sure well in preparation for today I got up at four o'clock this morning and I made a few notes, so I'm going to I'm going to refer to them. I'm not a technologist. Uh, um, probably most of the people in this room know more about the details of technology than I do. But I have a sort of macro view, which relates not solely to technology, but is really about the way in which technology intersects with human behavior. And I think that's a, a very important to understand that technology by itself um, has one implication, but if people don't want to use it um, or it doesn't inform, uh, um, if it doesn't respond to things that they're concerned with, it's not going to be adopted, it's not going to be used. So you can't only look at, at technology in the abstract you have to understand how it interacts with human behavior. And that's what, what I try to do. And I think 
that when technology does that successfully, then you see major changes. Um, you've asked me about what I regard as the most significant effect of technology or something like that. Um, and this is very basic, but I think it's, it underlines a, a lot of what we're seeing. And, and I revert really to the, uh, 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 the, the real-time digital communication. Real-time digital communication. If you think whether it's your cell phone, whether it's texting, whether it's email, that's sort of the core technology that informs a lot of what we're seeing in the real estate business. The ability for people to express themselves, express their needs, to express their desires, to, respect, to, re to express their emotions, 24-7 in real time, instantly, to anyone in the world that has a digital device, is the big story. Now let's think about how this is affecting human behavior and relates to the real estate business. Now that the workplace is portable, because you all have your, your, uh, bi your business records uh, in your laptop, you know, instead of 10 filing cabinets, um, we're much more mobile uh, in our lifestyles, and we want more in different environments that can s support this portable work lifestyle. We want expanded work environments at home, so since we're able to have all our business records there, whether that's a study for some of us or whether it's a special work niche, um, we want to be able to work as we travel. Look at airport design. You know, what do you see? You see masses of desks, really. You know, we call them high tops. Um, we also want casual work plans that facilitate in-person exchanges, supported with proximate food and beverage. You know, we like our food and beverage to be nearby. And of course, that equates to co-working and, and uh, um, the typical co-working setup. And we have less need for formal office environments, but we want that too. So we want to be able to go to our office, we want to be able to take our laptop and go to some loungy cafe space, we want to go home and enjoy that. And if we're at the airport, have some downtime, we want to work there too or on a train, uh, or for that matter, uh, um, in our cars. Contrary to expectations early in the digital age, we have not transferred our working environments to our homes away from the offices. We want multiple work environments. You know, at one point, people thought offices were going to be obsolete. Everybody was going to work at home. Well, th that's not what happened. I could go on and on and liken digital communications to many of the lifestyle changes we're seeing. For instance, e-commerce. You know, Amazon works because you can email them, they email it back, and then uh, they ship in real time. And I can imagine coming changes in medicine, automotive, and other forms of transportation but if I went on and on, it would take all afternoon. However, the takeaway is that ta technology in relationship to human experience, as it empowers, changes, and enhances human capability and choices, is the big story. This is different than thinking about technology as a standalone phenomenon. 
And, and you're doing some significant amenitization of your buildings, Francis, and we've certainly talked about how the rapid change in tech has created this kind of entrepreneurial class who are tremendously mobile, and the nature of the way they want to work, like you mentioned, is they want a different workplace for every day of the week, depending on the task that, task at hand, the meetings they have that day, or, or where they might be working from. Um, there's so much changing, and you know, we also touched on some of the things that are not changing, and that are, quite frankly, staying the same, and for good reason. Do you want to talk about some of the things that are, are not changing? Well, uh, you know, I think I mentioned them before, the fact that we still want to have our, a traditional office space to go to. I mean, even if you take the co-working space, you know, people want their, their little private space, uh, mostly. I mean, some, some people sit at a communal desk, but other like, uh, but they want to be able to go out into the lounge. Uh, uh, they want to be able to move around. And um, traditional businesses, want to have a place to call home, a business home, not a home home. So I think those are examples of, of things that, are, that, that are, aren't changing. On the other hand, we're adapting our buildings to provide the informal work, play, live spaces that our mobile lifestyles permit. Whether we're home or on the go or in formal work environments, we no longer want to be bound to one location for our business records or our business communications. We want enhanced work, play, live environments that support all of our activities at the same time. Um, so, for instance, we're doing, we do a lot of retrofitting of older office buildings, suburban office buildings, or urban office buildings. And we have a standard module, you know, we now go in and we create what we call a business lounge, which looks a little bit like we work, you know, we've got, we've got the, um, uh, the um, econometric uh, steel case furniture, we have the digital media lounges, we have setting areas and couches and, uh, um, uh, tall top tables, and uh, some of them we put in uh, um, ca uh, um, cappuccino bars, if there is none, um, in, available in the building. Um, of course, we have ping pong, and of course, we have uh, pool. We have massage rooms. We, have, uh, we even have an art room, uh, in one that we just finished in Parsippany. And in addition, we typically have a fitness facility, and, um, and we have food and beverage often in a, a separate style uh, facility. Now, that, you didn't put that kind of stuff in buildings 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but that's what, what people want to have to have access to, whether they're working upstairs or they're in the co-working uh, or, or whatever part of the building they may, they may be in. You know, Francis, when we first started with Disrupt Sierra five years ago, this was a totally different landscape. Um, it was really a very private, you know, the nature of commercial real estate professional still is very privatized, but people have come to be more open to sharing information. And we talk, you and I talked about some of the benefits of that and um, why it's so important to continue to open ourselves up and have this give and take. Um, and I just think it's a very interesting kind of you know, industry uh, evolution. And so do you want to talk at all about that and kind of why that's cont continuously being, you know, more, more important? So you're, you're asking about the sharing of information by, um, I'm a little older than you are. Uh, sharing of information has really gone on for a long time. I remember in the 1980s when co-oping and condominium conversions were uh, sort of, there was a new wave of them, um, and I used to, that was, a, we, we had a large presence in that business, and uh, um, I used to do a lot of appearances at, at uh, um, various conferences about that, and people would sometimes say to me, well, you know, why are you prepared to share your uh, um, business practices with everybody? And I just have a, a, a feeling that what goes around comes around. And also, it pays to advertise uh, in the sense that 
If people know you're informed, if they know you're sophisticated, if they know you're thinking about these things, it will, that will bring opportunities. And sometimes there are bankers and, and other um, resource providers who are listening to you in addition to colleagues in the business. And we really have more to gain. The real estate business, yes, we compete on deals and there are a number of bidders there. And if I was bidding on a building, I wouldn't show you my bid sheet. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, it's not really that cutthroat competitive business. I'm, you know, not selling sneakers for $59 and you're across the street selling them for $57. Um, so I think, you know, raising, raising the level of information and sharing is, is healthy and is good for everybody. I want to turn over to some of the technologies that you're most excited to see either mature in the market or be developed. And you know, we touched on a couple things together, but I also want to hear, as a result of those, you know, introduction of new technology, what are some of the impacts? What are some of the potential changes? My own view, a little bit informed. I spent, I guess, last weekend skiing with a top uh, technologist at Harvard. And uh, so I'm just feeling a little bit about what he talked about, but it's, it's pretty obvious. I think autonomous vehicles will not only change the way in which we think about, the, about individual building locations, but will also reshape our urban and rural experiences. Um, I have a theory that transportation redefines geography and informs the path of growth. I remember years ago, I was having a conversation with uh, then smart guy, not so smart about certain things, uh, but with Governor Spitzer. And uh, you know he was very concerned about upstate economy. So I said, well, why don't you put in high-speed trains? You know, if it takes an hour to get to Albany, it's gonna change uh, um, the, the landscape in between. He said it was too expensive. But of course, that's what we see going on in other parts of the country. They're just building a high-speed train from uh, uh, Miami all the way up to Orlando. It goes through uh, Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale. Um, that's transformative when you, when you connect those, those kinds of urban areas. Um, I think, uh, in addition, uh, we've, we've talked about the the changes in live, work, play, but I think there'll be more. Um, I think about climate change and its relationship with technology. Yesterday on the television, <laughs> on some news program, they showed they were floating these balloons or something up into the air with some chemicals they thought might save the, save the world. Um, I think about digitally delivered medical diagnosis and treatment. Um, uh, you know, I have to test my blood and send my results to my doctor all the time. Used to have to go to a lab to do that. Now I do it at home with a little machine. And then I just text the results to him. He texts back and says, you're fine. And uh, um, so the whole nature, and you know, anytime you get sick or if you have a friend who has any serious condition, you go on on the web and learn about the disease in a way that you wouldn't have before, and that becomes particularly important as, uh, um, uh, as doctors are in more and more demand and it's harder and harder to see them. Um, another place that I see uh, um, potential interesting change in the use of personal data, we are using personal data now to affect the way we're informed politically, not always by sources that we'd like to be informed by, Russians, um, but uh, you know they're part of our landscape. And we also know that we're being uh, um, uh, sold things as consumers or, or marketed things on consumers based on our personal data profile. I can imagine using this data in a more constructive way as an education tool to inform us about areas in which our digital profile suggests that we 
are or might be interested. You know, just think about spell check, right? Your phone tells you when you misspell a word. Well, that's kind of an educational factor. But let's say he got much more sophisticated and um, uh, in ways that we can't fully imagine. Um, it suddenly tells us about things that it senses from our data would be important to us. Or frankly, it informs us about technology ourse uh, uh, ourselves. I was thinking yesterday, well, you know, my phone, like your phone, I mean, I'm sure you know more about your phone than I do, but I'm sure your phone knows a thousand things that you don't know, you don't know how to use. Imagine if your phone watched your behavior and said, hey, you know what, if you go to this, this thing or that thing, um, you can do such and such. Um, again, watching how you're, what you're doing and trying to educate you in ways to do it better or differently. I want to just ask, you know, are there any kind of, you know, lasting words that you have for the audience, the tech companies, disruptors in the audience that are really helping reshape some of the future of, of this industry? What would, your, what would your message be to them? Well, I'd, I'd be repeating myself, but I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Um, some of you know that in in addition to the real estate business, I also have a background in the publishing business. And one of our clients in that business is Dan Brown, who wrote Da Vinci Code. And, and I don't know how many of you spoke, uh, read his, not uh, was the last book or the book before, but essentially it was a story of a, um, a futurist who was about to announce uh, a, 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 something that would change the world. And... Uh, they kill him before he can make the announcement. And the book basically goes through this long, elaborate, typical Dan Brown chase thing until they find the secret. Um, and essentially, the, the end result of all of this is that um, uh, the book predicts the merger of, of, of uh, um, device technology, your cell phone, with your own bodies. So, and, and I mean, you've read about the glasses where, you know, you'll, it'll give you a, if you're lost, it'll give you a map of where you are and a million things and, you know, you'll blink once and it'll call your mother or what, whatever it does. Um, but the idea that the technology will be incorporated in some way and be integrated into your own functioning. So again, we look at the intersection between technology, human behavior, and human capability. I'd like to leave you all with. Thank you so much, Francis.